Hey, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Felipe and I'm a social skills and confidence coach. Today I'm very excited because I'm gonna be interviewing a really good friend of mine, Eva. She is an emotional and social skills coach for parents and kids. In this interview, we talk about how parents can better take care of themselves, how to both communicate better, express their emotions better, and teach that to their kids, as well as helping them to really navigate the social and friendship landscape a lot better. If you like this interview, subscribe, like the video, and definitely check out some of Eva's information down below in the description. She's also put together a short guide on how to better take care of yourself, self-care, and all that sort of thing. So again, it's down below in the description. All right, enjoy our chat. Here we are today. We're going to be uh, interviewing a very special guest today, Eva Gojanovic, right? Gojanovic, you <laughs> Gojanovic. have it. You're good. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got involved? Sure, absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me here. It's, it's awesome. For being here. I started off as a counselor and I started working in schools and in the schools I worked with a lot of kids who had behavioral problems. So it was a lot of helping them deal with their big emotions, big and small, their frustration levels, you know, frustration tolerance, and then their friendship skills and, and, and social skills. So it was a lot of helping them just like navigate the social landscape of friendships. And it was in a mm -hmm. um, elementary school. So it was kids working with kids from about like five to 10 years old. And I really, really enjoyed working with them. And then I realized the more that I worked with them, the more that I ended up working with their parents, families and the teachers and the community that worked with the kids because as cliche as it sounds, it really does take a village to raise a child. So <laughs> that's kind of where that came, came from. And then I started doing a part-time private practice where again, a lot of um, what we were doing in therapy and in the private practice was a lot of social emotional skills. So the social emotional piece is really about, you know, self-awareness, um, the self-regulation, being able to manage your own emotions and feelings social skills and just having empathy for others and being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and in somebody else's perspective. For the parents aspect of it, it really is, you know, helping the parents understand what their kids' social emotional needs are. But also, you know, there's such a huge parallel process between, you know, parents grow along with their kids. I mean, you're not mm. given a manual when you have a kid, you know what I mean? So you end up kind of learning as you go and a lot of it is reactive. So, you know, the, the stance of the social emotional skills coach for parents is really helping them step back a little bit and be more proactive versus reactive. When you say proactive versus reactive, are you talking about helping them better manage those emotions to anticipate when those tough situations will come? Is that what you mean? Or are those challenging situations? It's or how all to of it. Yeah, it's all of it, Felipe. So it's a little <laughs> bit of, you know, kind of anticipating, but it's also, you know, re recognizing what a parent's triggers are, how to manage those triggers, how to manage your own emotional responses, you know, when your kid is whining and acting out, how are you going to match that, you know, if you mm. come at them, you know, yelling or a little bit of a different tone, you're going to get an escalated response too. So it's all about kind of learning, teaching parents how to manage their own inner, inner fire that's going on when that stuff's <laughs> happening, um, as well as help it, helping their kids do the same. That sounds amazing, actually. From what you've learned, what has been the biggest challenges for kids? I Emotionally think and socially, I would say. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think for one is just understanding emotions. Like emotions kind of start with a physiological response and then not being able to know what to do with it. Not knowing, you know, is this something that's normal? Like what is happening inside my body? Um, you know, what am I reacting to? Like what is happening? So I think, you know, the basis of it is really just understanding their emotions being able to do something productive with their emotions. Um, so a lot, you know, a lot of blowouts happen because these kids don't have the vocabulary and the ability to yet say like, I'm frustrated because Susanna took my toy, you know, it's just like this blow up explosion of anger and they can't really verbalize it. So I think that's kind of the very, very beginning unit and, and basis of, of the work that I do with kids and what that social emotional skills looks like is being able to build their vocabulary for emotions. Like what, you know, what are these 
feelings, um, letting them know that it's normal to have feelings and that it's okay mm. to have feelings um, and being able to talk about it. So that, that again, kind of goes back to having parents that are able to model that. Wow. You know what I mean? So if a parent is able to say like, wow, I'm really frustrated right now or I'm feeling sad because blah, 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 that kind of starts setting the tone for kids to be like, oh, you know, this big superhuman supermodel role model that I've got also has these feelings and it's okay to have those feelings. Have you found that there's a difference between girls or boys basically in terms of their emotions and how they manage them or even that they're set with an expectation very different from an early age? Yeah. Well, as what's that like in terms of the parents, in terms of the emotional communication? That, that's such a good question. And I think, you know, in regards to the girls and boys, there's a lot of different social conditioning that happens. Mm. Um, girls from a younger age. And, and I remember for me as a girl, it was, you know, oh, um, you know, you don't look so pretty when you're crying or, you know, oh, good girls don't get mad good girls don't get angry, good girls don't sit like that, good girl, you know, X, Y, and Z. And for boys, a lot of the social messaging that they get is, you know, toughen up, be a man, stop crying, and things like that. So the social conditioning um, in regards to how they relay their emotions or how, how they show them, a lot of the times, you know, like in anger for girls will look a lot like really sad and crying because they don't know how to really connect with that anger part of them right. and for boys their sadness might look like anger so you know if a, for for young boys like if their friends you know aren't playing with them on the playground it kind of translates quickly to like angry maybe they'll go push them or some kind of form of aggression whether it be verbal or physical aggression right, whereas right. Really it's a feeling of sadness like man my buddies don't want to play with me Right. So that, that's kind of, um, that's a great question though. And it is interesting to see the, the difference of how, how emotions are conveyed, especially at that age group. Wow. So what about the parents though, and how they can set an example for their kids, how they express emotions? The belief in the premise that I come from is that everybody's doing the best that they can in any given moment. So like even the mom or the dad who's completely stressed out at that moment, it's just what they got, what they're working with or with the resources that they have. Yeah. But how does that translate later down the line, you know, in, in regards to the kids? So for the, pa for the parent piece, like you're asking Felipe, it's just about recognizing what, what their emotions are and what they're conveying. So are they okay with their own emotions? You mm. know, a lot of the time, you know, parents might have a hard time for themselves, you know, if they're, if they're getting into an argument with a spouse, how do they handle that? You know, their kids are watching and their kids are kind of modeling that behavior. Are feelings okay to talk about or is it something that we don't talk about? Um, and I think it, it kind of ties into a lot around the not even so much limiting beliefs, but the beliefs that are set through our families. Like um, for my family, traditional Croatian, you know, you said yours was conservative Mexican. So there's a cultural piece to it too, but yeah. like what happens in the family stays in the family. So we don't talk about, mm. you know, um, any blowouts that we've had in the family outside. So it's those messages. It's really about the messaging um, that, that occurs between parents and their kids and and what that what the um making meaning making of those messages are so the creation culture is not as gossipy as the mexican culture <laughs> oh it's very gossipy but <laughs> <laughs> it's very gossipy but it's more just like keep it keep it in, inbound you know what i mean right talk about other people not the family right yeah so, yeah, yeah. We, can talk, we can talk about our neighbors but don't talk to them about us <laughs> right right what is really healthy um, childhood when it comes to friendships and, and for, for people that are listening to this that are thinking all right how do I help my kid out with their social life? I think it's important to always have in the background like what the developmental age is and what the chronological age is so even if your kid is you know four or five years old mm. you know what are the expectations kind of around that in in um normative development so taking a look so like a two or three year old you know they do a lot of parallel play and a lot of the parents are like why won't my kid play with any other kids they just want to do their own thing because it's developmentally appropriate they're just kind of trying to figure out their own their own space their own toys their own things you know they're just creating their own 
environment. So it's being a little bit more aware to like where they, where your kids are at developmentally, developmentally. Yep. Um, in, in terms of social relationships, at the, I'm talking mostly about the school age because that's where my background is mostly, you know, elementary sure. and secondary school. Um, but it's just about navigating like, oh, you're a person that has your, your set of feelings too. Like, it's not just all about me because that's a whole different scope, you know, especially when kids enter school, like, it's not just about me. It's not my world and you're living in it. It's our world and we're, you know, we're, we're sharing in it. So it's being able to understand that. But Felipe, like you were saying too, you know, you were a shy kid and you had to work on your social skills. I think everybody has to work on their social skills. And that's the thing, um, you know, in, in the education system today, now it's becoming more normalized, you know, that there's school adjustment counselors and teachers have a lot of education around, you know, social emotional skills, which is huge, but before it wasn't really taught. Yeah. So, you know, where are these kids learning it? At home, their parents weren't taught those skills either, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like a trickle down effect. So, right. you know, being more aware, and I think that that is a big part of the social emotional piece and self-development is now as a society, I feel like we're becoming more aware of like, well, where are these kids going to pick up these skills? We need to teach them. They need to be taught. They don't just come naturally for the most part. You know, you mm. kind of need to, you need to tweak them a little bit. So how, did, how does emotional intelligence and self-awareness, I guess, translate into social skills and connection? Yeah. Um, I think it's just being self-aware knowing what your likes and dislikes are, how you can connect with people on a, on a, um, a real basis, knowing what you stand for, um, not being easily swayed, knowing what your comfort levels are. Mm. Um, you know, I think, I think for kids sometimes too, you'll see, I'm just thinking I'm, I'm having like flashbacks of different situations from, from work, but I think, you know, you see different kids, like who are the ones that go with the crowd? Who are the ones that are the leaders? Who are the ones that will do anything that you tell them to do? And, you know, these little social dynamics are kind of like, they, they play out again later on in life too, in the work yeah. area. And, you know, like who are the leaders? Who are the followers? Who are the ones that are going to be easily swayed? Um, so that, that's kind of how it plays out. Is, is that very related to um, self-esteem as well? I know that probably is a whole other topic, but <laughs> <laughs> we could go. I think we, I, how much time do we have, Felipe? <laughs> uh, we have a couple hours now. No, not I'm enough saying. time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for self esteem, I think the more grounded you are and who you are as a person and the more aware, the, the more of a self concept you have and the more awareness you have and the, the more kind of you feel good about yourself because you're aware of the things that make you feel good. You're aware of who you are, what you stand for. I kind of said that already, mm -hmm. but those are the kinds of things that give you competence. And when you have those areas of competence that comes with, you know, the self-esteem of feeling like good about yourself, handle this, or I can handle the situation. I can do this. I can try. When it comes to um, self-care, let's say part of it, part of it is awareness and all that. So, what do you what would you recommend for for a parent that's stretching out right now it's maybe they have a lot going on and so forth like everyone does and especially nowadays with the quarantine and everything and the pandemic for self-care what would you recommend that's either in conjunction uh with your children or even on your own when you have a little bit of a long time what would you recommend okay. I just want to say it's so important. It's so, so, so <laughs> important. Like whatever you want to call it, whether it be self-care, soul care, whatever, it's so, so important. And, you know, I think it starts at the individual basis. Yeah. Um, you know, as humans, we're social beings. We want to feel that connection. We need to feel that connection to feel safe and secure. And in order to feel connected, we need to be okay with, you know, what's going on internally and, and with ourselves. And um, I love the topic of self-care. And I think that sometimes self-care gets kind of like a, a bad reputation for being selfish. And it's so not. Mm. I mean, self-care is just everybody's right to feel good, you know, and, and, what their, and what their needs are. And in order for you to be able to give to other people, you need to be whole and you need to you need to feel okay 
Um, and you know, when we talk about self-care, what it really reminds me of is just the ability to take care of yourself, the ability to know your own needs and make sure that those needs are being met. Um, you know, as a child, you kind of look to your parents to get those needs met for the most part or any caregiver. Um, and then kind of, as you go on to adulthood, you need to start kind of taking care of care of yourself. So you need to know what, what your needs are. And I, I think what's interesting, and I've had a lot of conversations and, and it made me laugh a little bit when you were saying now, I mean, yeah, you know, we got Corona, COVID, working from home, financial stressors, you know, there's a boatload of stuff going on. And I think for self-care, when you, when it's reminiscent to me of Maslow's hierarchy, you know, that triangle of, you know, the five needs. And it, what's interesting is, is that with, with self-care, usually when you're under stress, the first thing to go is your basic physiological needs. So I'm talking about like the bottom rung of that triangle, which is the physiological needs of, you know, just water, sleep, nutrition. Like when you're stressed, that goes out of whack. You know, you don't, you don't start sleeping well, you know, you're thinking a lot, you might be grabbing, um, you know, like a, protein not to knock on the protein bars because i love them but you you know you're grabbing at what, <laughs> you're, you grabbing at protein bars here? you're grabbing at whatever you can get and so like are you really getting the nutrition that your your body needs um you know are you getting the sleep are you hydrating enough and drinking enough water so like once you start kind of slipping in those areas of course it's going to affect how you are in your relationships with other people how you feel about yourself you know, are you using your full potential and full maximum? And it just goes up, up on that, on that triangle. So self-care is really kind of just making sure like, let's get back to basics. Let's make sure that our basic needs are being met. Um, so again, how, you know, you, I know you talk a lot about social skills and social awareness, and that starts with self-awareness. Like when you start feeling a little out of whack, like take a step back and just see, all right, what's happening with my body? What's yeah. happening with me? What am I letting slip? No, I love it. I actually really like that you went into kind of the pyramid because I don't know, I, I was thinking about it, uh, especially nowadays that, you know, you're spending a lot more time alone or, or with your family than you are with a social group or, or getting distracted, if you will. So you really face a lot more of your demons, if you will. And, and, uh, and one of the things that I was thinking about with self-care is that it's almost, yeah, I mean, it's, it, for me, it's almost like um, physical health. You know, many times we, yeah, we eat healthier, we maybe go to the gym, go for a run, or get active, get the body moving, but oftentimes we disregard our mental health. And it's funny that you mentioned the pyramid of needs because when your mental health kind of sucks or when you're not feeling all that great, it's hard to keep up even habits that will benefit your body, habits that will, uh, your financial life, habits that will benefit your family life. And so, as you mentioned, you know, it's not, it's not selfish at all to take care of your mental health because it absolutely affects every other area. And, and many times it's even, it can be even more important than even your physical health because it leads to, leads you to not needing to distract, to overeat, to, I don't know, all kinds of different ways to, to feel better, to sedate any kind of negative emotion that you might be feeling. And, and for me, at least personally, I've noticed that when I don't take care of myself mentally, I tend to slip into negative habits, um, whether it's, you know, again, whether it's physical negative habits or financially, I'm not, I'm going to procrastinate on things I have to do. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Screw this. I'm done. <laughs> right. I'm with so, you. I'm not in my head because I'm like, yep. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that's, uh, I don't know, that's how I see it. And, and for me, at least, it's become a, such a priority because it connects me, it connects me to my soul, it connects me to my body, it connects me to my family, it connects me to pretty much the whole world as opposed to feeling disconnected, like things don't make sense or that sort of thing. Um, I think positive mental habits uh, are incredibly important. And, and in my book, they're many times more important than other positive habits that you might have exercise regimen. Yeah, of course, it's going to relieve stress. But overall, I think it's important to, to get a handle of your mind, get a handle of your emotions, or at least an awareness so you can, I guess, be more of yourself, be more joyous, be more 
more relaxed, more at peace. And, uh, and yeah, I think, it's, I think it's something that should be given a lot more priority. I, I agree. Some mental flossing is good for your mental health. <laughs> I agree with you completely. Like your mental health and, and your self-care go hand in hand. Um, you know, and, and while, um, you know, your, your self-care and those basic needs can kind of be an indicator for your mental health, it can go the other way too. Like when you start kind of noticing like, uh, you know, I just don't feel motivated. I don't feel like doing this. And you're kind of like, backing away from your general like baseline self it's a good indicator of like all right well what can i do and that's the piece of that self-awareness is like all right i i understand i get i'm feeling disconnected from my friends i'm feeling disconnected from my family why is that what can i do like what what's happening right now and just being a little bit of you know self-love and give yourself a little bit of credit like what what is it that i can do and um i just think it's so important to again just check your check in with yourself because i do think a lot of people when they do start to slip a little bit um you know they do they can contract into themselves and that's when you know the negative thoughts kind of keep going keep cycling and then you're you're less inclined to reach out to others when you're in that space because mm -hmm. you don't you know you don't feel like connecting and that's when you got to connect you know, that's, that's when you got to reach out. And I know a lot of people, Felipe, and I don't know about you. How, how are you with like, when you, you know, when you start feeling a little bit, when you see yourself slipping, are you one that reaches out for help or no? Uh, I definitely am. I'm not sure where that habit came from, but I have, you know, seven or eight different friends that I can talk about the same thing that won't get annoyed. At least I won't get annoyed. They're like, Hey, you know, can I share what I'm going through? But, you know, when you mentioned that about as far as con uh, contracting and, and kind of moving inward instead of just connecting with people, another thing that I've noticed that I did used to do in the past, though, is I would push through. I thought it would be, like, for example, I'm, I'm working, on, let's say, in the past, I, I was working on some kind of uh, project uh, to grow maybe my wine tour company or something like that. I'm not feeling great, but I'm thinking, hey, um, let's just push through it. Nowadays, I take a step back and I kind of just go, process whatever I'm going through, uh, because what I notice is that I become very ineffective. Even when I push through, things either don't work out as well, I come off the wrong way, or, you know, there's so many different things that I create resistance for myself when I push through it. So never mind just, you know, kind of going into myself and not seeking, you know, to connect with people and get that help. Um, but also the whole thing about just kind of plowing through it is uh, it's something else, something that I, at least for me, maybe some for other people it works, but I think in the long run, it wears you out and it's not, it's not a very good long-term strategy. Do you, do you feel like part of that maybe might be some familial beliefs that were handed down of like, pick yourself up by the bootstraps, like push on through and just kind of like barge your way through, through problems or where do you think that came from? Let me get back on the couch real quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, uh, I think it has to do with as a teenager being told that I was lazy. When I started some, you know, some companies, and in the beginning, and even for years, I was working 12, 14 hours or more, that sort of thing. And it worked out great, but I was very miserable. So the excuse or the thing that I would tell myself when I was feeling horrible, it was that I couldn't take a break. It would mean that, that, that would mean something negative, meaning that I'd be lazy or something like that. But it's not just gonna. Uh, you know, as you would say, men up or that sort of thing. But it's even more that, fortunately, I was carrying a lot of stuff of, of guilt of just taking some some time off. And so I had to be aware of it. And then, you know, yeah, I realized that the results were um, were not that great either. When I was doing activity during those, um, in those states. So nowadays, yeah, I, I take a step back. Uh, 
bike ride, I meditate, or and always keep up with a with a healthy uh, mental routine. Nice. How about you? So one thing that I've I've noticed about myself, and this is you know th for for years of kind of just being into self development and and trying to kind of improve different habits and and tweak things, is I realize I oscillate a lot. Like I have ups and downs in terms of like some days I'm super motivated, I'm jacked, like I'm I'm excited to do things, and then other days. I kind of feel like demotivated or what am I doing or, you know, is this the right step or, you know, and, and I did notice that it does come along with my self care and my other habits. Like, what is it that I'm doing that when I feel good and what is it that I'm doing when I don't feel so good? So that's where that self-awareness piece comes in because I did notice um, when I'm kind of on the downward slope, it's because I'm not eating good. And I found, you oh, know, really? I used to think food like huh? food is a huge thing for me in terms of what it is that I'm putting into my body um what it is that I'm consuming and I love I love sweets and I also have the bad habit of like I love the sweet and salty combo so I'll go for like <laughs> chocolate and then I want like chips to go with it and I'm like I oh, don't back to sweets so when I'm eating a lot of that junk food it really like has a physical impact on my mood and just how I'm feeling and I yeah. feel like after so kind of knowing that has helped me tweak my eating habits a little bit um wow. so so that's one thing for self-awareness is just being like all right yeah like yeah it tastes good but i feel like crap after i eat it so like i'd rather eat something you know a little bit healthier that gives me a little bit more energy i gotta say though the the ice cream in croatia is so bomb it's like so it's good. so good it's so yeah, good like, oh my god i can't get it here like that but, but yeah so so that makes sense um so whenever you so when did you really start noticing those those things with food? I think honest honestly, like when I started working with kids and and do and teaching those lessons about self awareness, and I was like, I need to like I'm I'm teaching it, like I need to start walk taking a look. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Walk the talk and and take a look and see what I'm doing. Um, so that's definitely one of the things is just intake. Um, I also noticed time wise, like I I'm in. I'm more of an introvert, but I can kind of play off the extrovert role. Like I really, you know, I enjoy going out. I have a blast when I'm out, but I also need to kind of go back to myself and like read a little bit and just spend time with like me, you know what I mean? Without, without the, the external noise. Yeah. So I found that kind of when I'm running on all cylinders and like do like saying yes to a lot of things that um, I don't necessarily want to be doing, but just feel like I have to that's when I kind of start slipping a little bit too, because it's not like what I want to be doing or, or, you know, it's, it's too much energy and I need to kind of like recharge my batteries a little bit. It, it kind of goes back to what you said about knowing what you want and knowing what you're about so that otherwise you compromise and you do instead of filling yourself with positive feelings and what you enjoy, you're just kind of breaking your boundaries. Yeah. And I think especially what you had mentioned, you know, the, the holidays coming up and okay, this year, it looks a little bit different with Corona and, you know, people aren't going to be able to engage in so many social gatherings, but it does remind me of just how inclined we are to do things for other people and not for ourselves. Mm. So, you know, just how many times you know, during the typical holiday season, do you agree to do certain, you know, family gatherings, dinners, going out, um, parties, where sometimes what you really need is just to kind of like chill out a little bit and, and relax, but you're saying yes to all these things. Right. And something that's really helped me, Felipe, and I think it helps a lot of my clients and a lot of people is that, you know, flip it a little bit. It's not that you're saying no to somebody, but you're saying yes to yourself. Mm. you know what I mean so just that little tweak of like no I'm just gonna you know I want to read a book but I'm gonna say no to my friend who wants to hang out I'm not necessarily saying no to her I'm just saying yes to me and that's okay and it feels a little bit it feels a little better to to frame it that way sometimes so I think that that's kind of a little tip and trick if you will in terms of self-care is just kind of being being more okay with saying yes to yourself have you, have you found um, other ways to really not only get in touch with what you want, first of all, and second of all, how to choose that more? Besides, yeah, definitely switching, uh, you know, reframing what that means in terms of it, just saying you to, 
saying yes to you, any other things that you found to really get a feel for what you want in, in really establishing those habits of, of going for that and saying no to more of the things you don't? For me, it's also kind of like uh, almost a recipe for what are the moods that I enjoy? Like, where do I like mm. to be? So, you know, I, I think most people would agree that they like to feel good and happy, you know, and that's not always like 100% of the time feeling, but kind of just sure. knowing how to create those feelings. So if, you know, if you're feeling a little bit bummed out one day, yeah, absolutely, 100% you want to explore that, you know, what's happening. But you also want to know, like, what are the little tweaks that you can do that will get you feeling up? Like, for me, I love music. Music can put me in a good mood, like, right away. Um, so kind of knowing that, like, if I'm a little bit slower in the morning, like, all right, I think a little Whitney Houston needs to come <laughs> on. And <laughs> So it's, it's almost like I would, I would encourage people to kind of look at, look at different feelings and different emotions and kind of see like what leads to that feeling, what leads to that emotion. Like, all right, when I, you know, when I'm feeling bummed out, it's because, you know, I'm feeling lonely. I haven't reached out. I haven't hung out. Um, okay. So like, what can you do now to kind of flip it a little bit? Or, you know, the recipe for a good mood might be good music, dark chocolate, a bath, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever it might be, but just kind of knowing. Like, describing my normal Friday. <laughs> a bubble bath? Nice. Oh, bath, chocolate, and uh, I know. <laughs> you, you do self-care so well. Oh, I, I'm the best, yeah. Anything else that, you know, that you would recommend for self-care, especially for parents? Uh, when it comes to even, you know what, I'm curious, is there anything you would recommend for self-care even with, with their kids? I, I, I saw that like excitement that you got, you're like, actually, no, I'm going to ask you this. Just parenting in general, uh, you know, I have a three-year-old daughter and I think a lot of the times you just, like, there's just this feeling that you need to give, 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 give. And then you kind of feel like a vending machine of just like, I'm just giving and giving mm. and giving. So kind of re replenishing your own batteries. And, you know, the best lesson we can learn is from stewardesses. And it always takes me back to that. And, you know, I have a coach too. Um, and he always says, you got to put your oxygen mask on first. And that's, that's so true. You know, you can't be of any help to anybody else, you know, whether it be your kids or your spouse or whoever, if you're not taking care of yourself first. So strap on that, <laughs> that oxygen mask on yourself first. And by doing that again, um, knowing when to take the time out for yourself. Um, you know, I think it's also good modeling for your kids too. Like mommy needs a break right now, or, you know, let's, let's do some downtime, you know, let's color, let's relax. Or, you know, I'm feeling really, um, anxious about something right now. Like how can we bring it down a little bit and, and nice. showing that with your kids. And, and so for, for kids too, you know, you asked about like what parents can do with their kids. Um, I think it's exploring the body a little bit and your, mm -hmm. your heart rate. So I think a fun activity to do with your kids is like just ramp up, you know, wrestle, roughhouse a little bit and then be like, oh, let's check our pulse. Wow, our hearts are beating really, really fast. Let's try and bring that down a little bit. And then just do some like calming activities like, whoa, did you see how like how much lower your heart rate got? Or, you know, how do you feel right now? Um, so just well, kind of bring, bring no, I like it. It brings a lot of awareness to the body. Yeah. And too, with kids to explore, like, what are, what are things that you like to do? What are things that you don't like, that you don't like to do? Um, you know, is it, whether it be puzzles or drawing or coloring, you know, just, just explore and navigate different activities that you guys can do that you guys can enjoy together as like a little bit of peace time together. Nice. All right, Eva, well, if somebody wanted to uh, get a hold of you, what would be the best way? And what kind of things can they, uh, can you help them with? Right now I'm on Facebook, so it's Eva Goyanovich. I finally changed my picture, so it looks more <laughs> like me because the last one was probably from 15 years ago with a dog yeah. who's no longer alive. So I, uh, I thought it was time to, to switch the picture. So it's Eva Goyanovich. Um, I'm working on a website currently, but that'll come out later on, you know, through the Facebook. So for now, Eva Goyanovich, so if somebody wants to DM me, you know, please feel free to do so with a little bit of information in terms of what it is that you're looking for. 
Um, and what I can help you with is just, you know, the social emotional skills, especially for parents and kids. So for parent, for you parents out there, it's all about, you know, you're, I know that you're doing the best you can. So if, if you want to find ways to kind of improve just how you're reacting to your kids, if you've dropped like Santa 20 times in one day, like Santa's watching, Santa's watching, <laughs> I can help you with that in terms of you being, you know, be, being able to kind of set limits with your kids without, you know, the threats of Santa um, and, and, and helping your kids kind of, you know, feel good about themselves and also be, become more aware of their own emotions. Awesome. Well, we'll put your information down here and, um, yeah, no, thank you so much for, uh, for being a part of this. Uh, I was thinking about interviewing you for a while and yeah, I was really happy that, uh, that we got to do this. Um, so thank you so much. Same here, Felipe. Thank you. And I love what you do. I've checked out some of your YouTube videos and I know that you are a self-care junkie as well and self-development <laughs> junkie and all things for improvement. So I think that's awesome. So thank you so much for the work that you do too. Awesome. Appreciate it.